Welcome to this preview of Plymouth Plantation's newest exhibition, History in a New Light, Illuminating the Archaeology of Historic Patuxet in Plymouth. We would like to thank our sponsors, Kathy and Bob Brower, Carlo and Catherine LaMagna, Colonial Dames of America, and Mass Humanities. This exhibition would have not been possible without their support. We also want to thank our partner, Project 400, as well as Drs. David Landon and Krista Baranek and their team at the University of Massachusetts Boston Fisk Center for Archaeological Research. With this exhibition, Plymouth Plantation wanted to do something a little different for the 400th anniversary of Mayflower's arrival, and instead look to the 12,000-plus years of history that have taken place in this spot to better reflect on how the landscape has changed by the people using it, and how they, in turn, have been changed by this landscape. One of the most exciting ways we have been thinking about this at the museum is through recent archaeology being conducted in downtown Plymouth by the University of Massachusetts Boston Fisk Center for Archaeological Research and Project 400 as well as through a re-examination of the rich archaeological collections that we hold here at the museum. Archaeology, documentary analysis, oral history, and fine and decorative arts all go into the research that we do here at Plymouth Plantation and inform our interpretations at our living history sites. The beginning of the exhibition starts with establishing the Wampanoag world before the arrival of Europeans on these shores. The settlement of Patuxet stood where the town of Plymouth is now, but it is important to note that the Wampanoag people of Patuxet would not have been isolated or alone. In fact, the Wampanoag had extensive and complex communication and trade networks. These stone tools, recovered from a site near the museum, reflect 8,000-plus years of technological change. Archaeological analysis of these tools demonstrated that the raw materials were acquired from as far away as New York, Pennsylvania, and the Great Lakes region, while Wampanoag oral history suggests that the networks extended as far as Ohio and perhaps beyond. The waterways were significant means of travel, but also provided resources to the people living along them, and we see archaeological representations of the different ways that those waterways were being used over time. As we continue through the exhibition, I wanted to take a moment to talk about this display in particular, since a block of dirt in a case might strike the average person as odd. Many people know the story about how Tesquantum, also known as Squanto, taught the pilgrims to plant with fish, but in the 1970s, some scholars started to question whether this was a practice traditional to the Wampanoag or if they had learned it from Europeans. An indigenous scholar at Plymouth Plantation named Nana Pashmit studied 17th century sources about planting with fish to demonstrate that this had been done by indigenous communities well before their contact with Europeans. At the same time, archaeologist Dr. Stephen Rozowski was excavating a pre-contact Wampanoag planting field in Truro, Massachusetts, and began working with Nana Pashmit. When archaeologists found fish bones in the planting mounds, the archaeology was able to complement the research that Nana Pashmet had been doing. The block of sediment in this case was taken a few years ago from the base of Burial Hill in Plymouth and impregnated with polyresin to preserve the intact dirt. When archaeologists sliced it open, they found small fish bones, likely herring, in this planting mound as well. We love this connection to Plymouth Plantation's own intellectual history, but these newer techniques in archaeology now allow us to continue to preserve this planting mound so that it is available for continued study as new developments in science change the types of experiments that we can do. Wampanoag people would live in Patuxet close to the water during the spring and summer, utilizing water resources in planting and processing foods. More tools than just fishing equipment would be needed, and this case contains the types of items that would have been necessary for weaving reed mats, processing nuts and seeds, and manufacturing machoon, or dugout canoes. After felling a tree, the Wampanoag would use fire to hollow out the inside, scraping the burned wood away with shells or stone adzes. Machoon ranged in size, with some large enough to hold 40 people. When the Europeans arrived with their own technologies, they were accessing the same water and shore resources as the indigenous people. Despite obvious differences in materials and forms, this part of the display aims to demonstrate how similar different fishing technologies are throughout time, and includes reproductions of 17th century Wampanoag, 17th century European, and 21st century sinker weights, fish hooks, and nets. Capturing large numbers of fish was sometimes necessary, and the Wampanoag would construct fishing weirs similar to this model. Fish would swim into the fence of woven branches and would get stuck in the holding area, making them easy to catch. Beginning in the 16th century, Europeans began regularly visiting what we now call New England to access the rich fishing grounds. A permanent settlement was not successful on the Massachusetts coast, however, until the arrival of Mayflower. This model of the ship was constructed by renowned model shipbuilder Eric A. R. Ronenberg, Jr. between 1973 and 1974. It represents William A. Baker's intended design for the reproduction ship Mayflower II. 
This model was made so accurately that our maritime artisans used it to check that they had cataloged the lines for the rigging correctly when the full-size ship was being restored. As European peoples increased their contact with New England, the types of materials being traded for and exchanged increased. When Europeans began settling this area, they still relied on items from home, but at the same time began to use indigenous objects in novel and familiar ways. These cases contain common items that would have been sent back and forth across the Atlantic. In the case of goods from New England, furs, fish, and timber were important resources driving the emerging colonial economy and prompting Europeans to settle on this land. The materials in the case representing goods from Europe, such as cloth, copper, and other items, would have been traded with Wampanoag people. However, archaeology also demonstrates that ceramic vessels from all over Europe were also sent to New England for their use by the colonists and also exchanged with indigenous communities. In this section of the exhibition, we move forward in time. Very quickly after the settlement of Europeans in this area, the waterways were being used not just for resource extraction and transportation, but now also for hydropower to turn the wheels of mills. Plymouth Plantation's own grist mill sits very near the location of the earliest grist mill in Plymouth, built in 1636, and this model of it shows how the falling water powers the millstone. By the beginning of the 19th century, however, Plymouth had started to become an industrial center in Massachusetts, with numerous mills and factories constructing dams along Town Brook and using them for power. Plymouth was no longer simply exporting resources from the land, but now manufacturing items. In the case, you see a sample of items that were made in Plymouth, a bottle from Plymouth Bottling Works, a hedge company brick, and a pharmaceutical bottle with the address of a Plymouth pharmacy. By the turn of the 20th century, however, most of these mills and factories were no longer operational, and the town of Plymouth began renovating the landscape to better entice the growing tourist trade and prepare for the 1920 tercentenary of Mayflower's arrival. By 2002, almost all industrial use of water on Town Brook had ceased, leaving behind decaying mill sites and stretches of water that few fish could pass through. Environmentalists began working with community representatives to remove the dams along Town Brook and upgrade the ladders and passages used by migrating fish. Thanks to these efforts, herring in particular have started to return for the annual run in numbers not seen for generations, and Plymouth has become a national model for waterway restoration. Archaeology has a long legacy at Plymouth Plantation, starting with our founder Harry Hornblower's training in archaeology and how it influenced his dream to create this museum. Because of this, this section introduces our visitors to archaeology as practice. There are several interactive displays here, including a three-dimensional reconstruction of an archaeological unit from the Project 400 Dig to explain features and why they're so important to archaeological interpretation, a floor-to-ceiling game to teach the importance of stratigraphic layers and archaeological analysis, and cases demonstrating how our artisans use archaeological materials to create the museum's reproductions, including a display of flint napping as a seven-step process from cobble to point. This beautiful indigenous cooking pot was recovered from the banks of the Cape Cod Canal in 1936 by Harry Hornblower's mentor, the avocational archaeologist Jesse Brewer. It likely dates to around 1500 because of the crust shell included in the clay to prevent it from shrinking and cracking during firing. This type of pot would be used for cooking in the coals of a fire, and its round base would be supported by rocks. The final section of the exhibition features the exciting new archaeological research being done by Project 400 and UMass Boston's Fisk Center for Archaeological Research. Since 2012, the University of Massachusetts Boston, Plymouth Plantation, and the Town of Plymouth have undertaken a collaborative project to explore the archaeology of 17th century Plymouth Colony. The UMass Boston team surveyed numerous locations downtown Plymouth, looking for intact 17th century deposits. But the town sits on top of the location of the Wampanoag settlement of Patuxet and the original Plymouth Colony settlement. 400 years of history and continuous occupation have significantly disturbed much of the evidence for 17th century activities. When the team began excavating at the base of Burial Hill, however, they found a small intact section of the original Plymouth Colony, including two 17th century houses, a portion of the palisade wall that surrounded the town, and a contemporary indigenous encampment or settlement. In this display, we wanted to immerse the visitor in the site, so a large drone photograph of the site at the end of the 2019 field season makes up the mural behind the object cases. On this mural, you can actually make out the three significant features in each of the cases relates. The case in front of the pit feature from the indigenous deposit contains some of the pottery fragments, stone tools, and the flakes from stone tool manufacture that were found in this area. 
Small fragments of European objects were also found here, helping archaeologists establish its use as contemporary to the 1620s Plymouth colony. The center case is positioned near the palisade wall feature and contains what archaeologists call small finds, typically items that would have been used for personal adornment or trade and kept close to the body, such as coins, beads, straight pins, and a cloth bail seal. These items could have been used and worn by the English colonists or traded with and repurposed by the Wampanoag people living near them. The third case is positioned in front of the early 17th century house feature, which appears to have been cut into the hill and contains fallen daub, or mud plaster, that might have made up the chimney or walls. This case contains the items representing 17th century English domestic life that were found in or near this feature inside the palisade wall. Wampanoag pottery was also found in these deposits, which is not that surprising when colonists would have to wait a long time for replacement goods from England. Why not trade with your neighbors for similar items? Our interpretive staff have experimented and found that because Wampanoag pots were placed on a tripod made of stones in the coals, they are used similarly to an English pipkin, which has three legs. So an English housewife using a Wampanoag pot would be able to continue to make food in an English way, just using a Wampanoag technology. The Project 400 display is designed to change as research continues. As there are more field seasons to come, it is likely that over time this research will develop the nuance of our understanding of what happened here in the 17th century and strengthen our own interpretation here at Plymouth Plantation of the relationships between the Wampanoag people and the English colonists. If you would like more information about the curatorial department at Plymouth Plantation and the collections that are stewarded by the museum, we invite you to explore the Learn tab at Plymouth.org or visit Plymouth.org collections. If you would like to view an online version of a selection of the exhibition panels, a link can be found at Plymouth.org collections. The exhibit will be installed in the Shelby Colum Davis Gallery until November of 2021. Thank you.